Michael, we are going to begin. I think you can all kind of smell something in the air. Uh, there is a lunch afterwards, so you're all invited to that lunch. It's a free lunch uh, put, put, put together by our Golden Circle. And so if you don't have plans, hang out and spend some time enjoying some fellowship and some good food. Uh, so let's go ahead and say a prayer. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and the gospel of Mark specifically and how Mark uh, wrote all about Jesus. And so in this moment, Lord, we pray that you would overwhelm us with Jesus. He is the focus of our faith. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. So may we fix our eyes and our thoughts on him as we open up your word together. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And so next week, I do want to remind you that the printout, I don't know what happened with the, the print machine, but you can see it's kind of blurry. I think three different words went over each other. There is no Bible study next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we do not have Bible study, so it won't be me. And then the Wednesday after, we will have a guest a teacher, and that is going to be Pastor Chris Troxel. So he's not really a guest. We know who Pastor Chris is. But he's going to fill in as we continue to go through Mark together. And again, uh, the question for us to consider, and certainly it's not just a question because we're here in a Bible study, it's always the question, right, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? We know Mark put together this sermon for the church in Rome and for those living in Rome in that time. And so now we have it passed down all the way to us, living and active God's word. And so we're focused in on Jesus. And so let's go ahead and, and get into your Bibles. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. I'll begin there. So this is the calling of Levi, another disciple. We know a couple of disciples have already been called to follow Jesus. But now this is Levi's turn, otherwise known as Matthew. And so in verse 13, Mark has that term again, once again, or immediately, or here we go, right, over and over again, he's moving. So once again, Jesus went out beside the lake, and so he'd like to go out by the lake. A large crowd came to him. Again, he's the one that draws people in. He's the, the secret of life, the one who people want. Right? And so of course a large crowd is going to him. And he began to teach them. And so Jesus is the teacher, he's the authoritative teacher, as we already learned. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and vowed him. And he called him to be his disciple. And while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners, and I don't know if your translation has it, but quotations and some notorious sinners, quote-unquote sinners, irreputable people, not just people who weren't perfect, but people who had a, a bad reputation about them, were eating with him, having fellowship with him, and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors. They asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so again, the question is, who is Jesus? And certainly there's a lot of answers here that we begin to see as we zero our attention and take this angle on the text. But certainly he's the one to follow. He's inviting people to follow. And, and so what does that mean? I guess my question for you would be this. Is, as you were growing up, who would you say was your mentor? Who would you say was somebody that you looked up to, right, that you wanted to be like? Parents, maybe maybe a teacher, maybe an uncle, right, a relative. Right. And what we know about Jesus is he is the one. He is the role model. There was a slogan about 30 years ago, and I'm sure it wasn't a new slogan, but maybe you knew about this, maybe you still think about this, but WWJD, what would Jesus do? Right? There are bracelets, there are stickers for cars. Right? If we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, because this isn't just a slogan we made up. And what does it mean to follow him if he is the one to follow? So 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Us pastors are actually, we do a Bible study every week together in our pastoral meeting. We're going through 1 John right now, and this popped out to us, and we talked about it for quite a bit. But 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. 
Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. WWJD. For him to be a, a rabbi and for us to be disciples, maybe you've heard Ray Bonderland uh, talk about this in the ministries that the world may know. Ministries, he's got a website called followtherabbi.com. It's a great resource to understand the text and, and the context behind the scriptures. But he talks about how the rabbis of old, specifically a rabbi named Hillel, uh, was quoted as, walk in my dust. Walk in my dust. That's how close you need to be, and that's how close the disciples were to Jesus. And what disciples would do with the rabbis, whatever the rabbi would do, they would do the same exact thing. Right? If the rabbi is going to walk on water, what is the disciple going to do? If a rabbi is going to pray, what is the disciple going to do? If a rabbi is going to cast out a demon, what is the disciple going to do? They're going to attempt to do the same things that the rabbi is doing. Right? That we would be covered in his dust, that we would be that close. And in every situation in life, right, some people would say this, right? the question is for us as Christians is, what does love require of me? In this moment, in all my choices. Right? When we say, your will be done, and we pray that on earth as it is in heaven, right? we know what God's will is in heaven, right? Love. Right? That's what his will was from the beginning, and so that is his will in every situation. But even more clear than that, and then we pause, what would Jesus do? Because that's what love would do. Let's not forget that. Right? He is the one to follow. He is the one to look up to. Right? To walk in the dust of. He is the one who set the example for us of how to live, how to love, how to walk by faith. A friend of sinners is the next uh, text that we see there. Uh, that's it in Matthew chapter uh, 11. Let's go there. And as we see Jesus having fellowship, right, this is a sign of friendship that he actually wants to have that relationship. That's why in Revelation he's standing at the door and knocking and saying, let me in so I can eat with you. Right? And that's what we get to do afterwards. If you're going to hang out, right, maybe friendships will be developed even deeper. Right? That's what friends do. That They hang out together. They eat together. Matthew chapter 11. For John came neither eating nor drinking, so John the Baptist, and they say he has a demon, so Jesus talking. The Son of Man, referring to himself, came eating and drinking, and they say, Here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Right? But wisdom is proved right by her actions, so he's referring to the actions of John the Baptist and himself, but he calls himself right, a friend of tax collectors and and sinners, people are calling him for that because they know that he is friends, right? And so, he's a friend of sinners. Right? Does that mean he's our friend? And so, another question I have for you is, what makes a good friend? What would you say? Let's hear a couple things. What makes a good friend? Loyal. Loyal. One who listens. One who trusts. One who needs help. Right in the time of need, always there. The good and the bad? Is that Jesus? That's Jesus. Right? And so Jesus says in John chapter 15, let's go there. John chapter 15, verse 13, he says, Greater love is no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, he says, if you do what I command. In verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. All right? And then he actually says that, that rabbi disciple term, you did not choose me, but I chose you. He reminds them, right? I chose you. I saw you in the crowd and I said, that's the one I want. And that's what... He did for his disciples, and the question is, are we his friends, or was it just the original disciples? We're his friends. Right? I love that hymn, right? What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Right? For us not to forget, right? he is our friend, he identifies himself as our friend, and he has fellowship with us. So the last uh, statement there about Jesus, as we continue, is that I put, he's a doctor. 
right? I'm hearing this, Jesus said to him in verse 17 or Mark chapter 2. It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come to call the righteous, not the righteous, but sinners. And so let's talk about that. Let's go to Psalm 51, verse 17. You guys having fun going back and forth in your Bibles, or at least trying uh, to keep up? I was actually thinking about, let's sing the, the song that, I, that my kids learn here at Trinity for the Old Testament. I don't know if you guys know that song, or the New Testament, how you know the books of the Bibles, right? But then I couldn't remember how to sing the song. So I'm not going to sing the song with you. But maybe next week we'll have some kids come in here to remind us. So as I say, let's go to Nehemiah or some book. We'll be like, oh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. I'm going to stop there because I can say them, I just can't sing them. But Psalm 51, verse 17, says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. And so, I mean, Pharisees, there's a kid's song, Pharisees, um, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be a Sadducee because they're sad. You see, and I forget the line of the Pharisee, but I mean, Pharisees have a bad rap. There are a couple Pharisees that actually do believe in Jesus, right? so they're not all that bad. And there's a couple Sadducees that actually follow Jesus, so they're not all that bad. But yet when we think of Pharisees, right, I think we think of pride. Right? The inability to actually say, I need to go to the doctors. I need help. Right? And there's help out there, and I will go to the help. The inability to be authentic, to be real, to say, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect. Right? And, and many of us still struggle with that. Right? The way we interact with others, maybe in our relationship with God, we're able to admit that, but with others, right, it's very hard for us to admit, to apologize, right? and not to just have our head up uh, up high, right? to be humble. Right? And, and the big thing is this, is that God says throughout the Psalms, and you see it here, right? God's looking for that contrite heart. Right? If you don't have the humble heart, do you need a Savior? You don't. Right? It's not the healthy you need a doctor. It's not that there's anybody healthy, right? Everybody needed a savior. Jesus came for everybody. But there are those that didn't think they were sick. And there are still those today right, that are unable to admit that they actually need help. That they don't have it all together. Right? And they're able to call a sin a sin and they can deal with it in a healthy way way by actually going to somebody or looking for somebody outside of themselves. And so that's what's going on there. In Romans chapter 3, go to Romans. And so I love it when we can go to Romans after Mark and kind of interact between the two because we know they're both written to the same audience. But Romans chapter 3, 11 through 13, uh, the Apostle Paul is saying this to the church in Rome. Right? Maybe they were thinking, some of them, right? we don't need a doctor, right? I'm good. But then Paul says, right, there's no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. The throats are open graves, the tongues practice the seed, the poison of vipers is on their lips. Right? He, he goes on right? and he says, all have sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Right? There are so many things that get in the way right? when we're evangelizing, when we're talking to non-Christians. But if we can talk about Jesus, right? and the main thing is the main thing, because the main thing is the main thing. If the main thing is forgiveness, well, do you need forgiveness or not? Or if you don't, well then, the good news, I guess, isn't good news for you because you don't need good news. But yeah, the conversation happens, right, and we realize once again who Jesus is, and we'll just call him the doctor. Right? The doctor is literally in the house, right? and he's here to heal, but most importantly, he's here to, to give true healing right? and has a forgiveness of sins. So a lot going on here with Levi that we know is called Matthew. It's as if Jesus, when you start understanding why do they have different names, right? Simon is actually Peter, right? Levi is actually Matthew. Right? We call these their apostolic names, their apostle names. It's almost as if Jesus kind of gave them a nickname. 
and not necessarily just a nickname just for fun, but he spoke a name over them, right, that to help them in their relationship with God, know that they are loved, to see the greater calling in their life. Uh, so let's keep going here to the next section. Uh, Jesus questioned about fasting. Now John's disciples, as John the Baptist, and we know some of his disciples actually became Jesus' disciples, and the Pharisees were fasting. I guess the question before we keep going here, right? Do we fast? And why would we fast? Right? Fasting is a spiritual discipline, a spiritual habit, right? If we got something big going on in our life, a temptation, a trial, right? something that we know is getting in our way, it's still big fast. It's not just a Lent time. It's not just I'm going to fast from meat, red meat, and eat fish. It's so much more than that. Right? And we know disciples of Jesus have always had spiritual habits of fasting. So I'm not going to ask the question, when was the last time you fasted? But sometimes things are getting out of control in our life to where we just need to fast. Or we need to really help listen to God's voice. I'm really struggling with this decision. Right? Or maybe someone in my life is really hurting. I'm going to fast on their behalf. There's a spiritual discipline that is, is so right and good and, and holy. So let's not forget about fasting. So some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. By the time, but the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. And he says this, no one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, if he does, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skin. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, he pours new wine into new wine skins. So let's deal with the bridegroom first. This is awesome that Jesus calls him the bridegroom. This is loaded. There's amazing. Bible studies we could do just simply on this and to wrap our minds around all the things that Jesus said and did as the bridegroom. Right? What does bridegroom mean? That he has a bride. Right? Who's the bride? Who's the bride? Church. I was listening to a, a teaching last night after our elders meeting on the Christian radio station and the guy was actually talking about this and he reminded me Right. What is the Father's role? As we think about the Trinity, Mark's already identified Father, Son, Holy Spirit for us. The Father's role is to select the bride. Right. So think about that. Right. God the Father and His Son, He wants to select a bride for His Son. So creation takes hold. And in creation, the prize of His creation is His mankind. Right. Ultimately, God wants to be his whole church, not just us, but, but all, right? For God to so love all the world, right? I love that, just thinking about the Trinity, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit, right? the Father's choice. Right? This is your bride, son. Go get him. Right? We hear Jesus actually saying, I love this, that John 14 is actually bridegroom talk. Right? He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in me, trust in my Father. My father's house are many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That is literally what bridegrooms would say after they would propose to the young girl. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. They would say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when it's done, I'm going to come and get you to take you to be where I am. And so that's bridegroom talk. It's marriage talk. Communion. Uh, the way uh, Jewish boys, even still today, propose to a young woman, they take a cup of wine, and if the woman drinks the cup, that means she's saying yes, but what he's saying is this is a covenant I want to step into, a new covenant I want to be in with you. My blood, your blood, becoming one, and over my dead body, right? Will this relationship be severed? And so will you take and drink the blood of this covenant? And if you drink it, she's saying, I do. I will. I don't know if we ever thought about that in our communion time. 
Right? But that's a proposal, and right? certainly we're renewing that covenant over and over again. I right? heard Jesus saying, here's my cup. Will you drink it? Right? But Revelation uh, chapter 21, let's go there for a moment as we consider Jesus the bridegroom. And the scriptures are loaded with this imagery. Right? If you were with us last winter, Song of Solomon, uh, we did a lot of study with all the Old Testament references to uh, the church being God's bride, Israel being the bride, and how that flew into the New Testament. Right? It's not just Song of Solomon, it's not just this one time, but there's tons of imagery there. And I think sometimes we as men struggle with that, right? but yet it's a truth right? to take hold of and to understand right? how much he, he loves us and what our relationship is like with him in his eyes. So Revelation 21, uh, verse 2. Uh, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, right? beautifully dressed for her husband. Then we skip down to denying. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven, the seven last plagues, came and said to me, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of of the Lamb, and he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. He's our bridegroom, and very contextually, right? What Jesus is saying is the bridegroom is here, and so this is a time of celebration. They're with me right now, right? But there is going to be a time where they want me to come back. And right? we know Jesus taught a lot of parables about. Uh, this sort of thing. Right? But there's fasting after I leave, but I'm here. I'm here right now. The bridegroom is here, and someday uh, we will definitely meet the bridegroom face to face, our groom, Jesus. I wrote the word fresh. Uh, fresh uh, because of the, the garments, right? Patch and unshrunk cloth and an old garment, so we know Jesus is new. He's fresh. He's the new covenant, He's the fulfillment of, of all. Right, John chapter 7, I love the imagery here. It's at the Feast of Tabernacles where the children of Israel gather together. And I love it that God throughout the Old Testament he has all these festivals. And we know that literally millions of people would gather and they would party. They would just have a joyous time. There'd be, there'd be dancing. There'd be eating. There'd be fellowship with one another. Right, but God actually said, you guys need to learn how to have a good time. It's a foretaste of what is to come, right? The great wedding bank, right? I love the imagery of heaven. I don't know when the last time we've been to a wedding, right? but wedding banquets can be a lot of fun. A lot of fun. There's a beautiful picture in the scriptures. And so the Feast of Tabernacles, this is when the, the children of Israel would, would remember what took place in the wilderness and how God provided for them the, the manna, the quail, um, the water. Right? And then Jesus says in verse 37, on the last day of the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Right? Living water. Right? Fresh water. I got water bottles in my car. I don't know how many of you have water bottles that have been opened. You drank a couple sips, and then you, you close it, and then maybe you fall underneath your seat. That happens quite a bit. My, my kids drink water bottles. They do this. But there's some times where I'm just thirsty. I'm driving my car. And you know what I do? I find a water bottle that I have no business drinking out of. Because who knows who drank it. But I'm thirsty. And so I'm going to drink it. Does it taste fresh? No. There's a difference between fresh water and stale water. There's a difference between fresh venison and... <laughs> and medicine has been in your freezer for a couple years. There's a difference between fresh walleye and fresh perch versus perch and walleye have been in your freezer for a while. Right? Fresh. Right? Let's remember this is, this is Jesus. Right? And maybe we've heard sermons on this text before, right? but I definitely see Jesus talking about his flexibility. Right? If you lose your flexibility, right? the ability to adapt, Right, certainly we have the truth. We talk in, in, in church circles about adiaphora. Right? There's flexibility within holding on to the, the truth. And if we lose our flexibility, right, and we bring Jesus into it and the Holy Spirit, 
And the Holy Spirit likes to get us to think outside the box often and follow his movement. Right? What happens? If we lose that flexibility, if we, if we lose what true what is true about Adiaphora, we crack and we break and we fall apart. But Jesus is always bringing that freshness, that newness right, into our lives. Every day his mercies are new. That's what he is. Freshness every day. Right? Fresh starts every day. New starts every moment of every day. Thank you, Jesus, that you are fresh. Fresh fruit, fresh vegetables. Right? This is who you are to us. This sermon this week we're going to be talking about tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. I love that imagery, right? Of fresh food. And how badly we crave that. Not stale food, not fruit. Food that's been in our cabinets forever and our fridge forever, but fresh produce, fresh food. Jesus is fresh. Is it okay that we call him fresh? Let's keep thinking about Jesus. So let's go to Luke chapter 2, 23. Now we're going to hear about him being the Lord of the Sabbath. So verse 23 of Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, verse 23. One Sabbath... Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as the disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. A lot going on here, and so let's spend some time. Uh, the first thing I wrote there is, who is Jesus? He's a student of God's Word. Just the very fact that Jesus is quoting the Old Testament means that he, he knew the Old Testament. Yes, he's God. Right, so, of course, he knows the word, but we know Jesus grew up as a young Jewish boy and went to synagogue. Right? We see him when he's young, and we hear more about how he's talking about the teachings of the faith. Right? Where is Jesus, Mary and Joseph are wondering? Right? It's not a parenting uh, sermon. Right? How parents should always keep their eyes on their kids. Right? It's a Jesus sermon that Jesus is a student of God's word, his father's house. Right? He wants to be about his father's business. That's what he told them. Certainly we don't know what the dynamic was like for them to raise little baby Jesus, little adolescent Jesus, teenage Jesus, but that was happening. He's a student of God's word. If we could just go to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Is Nehemiah before Psalms or after Psalms? Before, right? It's one of the historical books, so those are before uh, the wisdom poetry, the prophets come after the wisdom poetry. Nehemiah chapter 8, and so the children of Israel have, have lost the Torah, they've lost the word of God, right? They're in exile, the, they're scattered, and now they've returned, and all of a sudden they find the word. They find the word, right? They find the Torah, and in chapter 8, it says Ezra's going to read uh, the law, read the word. Of God in verse 12, and there's a lot going on in this whole section. It says, All the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. And so, what happens is Ezra and Nehemiah they build a tower, a huge tower, and that's where pulpits come from, where right? you want to elevate the word of God. They build this word tower, and all the children of Israel assemble, because they told them to assemble. And then they have Levites and priests scattered throughout, and they just begin to read from the word, and they read for hours upon hours upon hours, and the people are just standing up because they're so hungry, and they have so much reverence for the word of God. But in the midst of that, the Levites and priests are actually doing Bible studies. They're actually doing Bible studies. They're students of the word, and the people are joyous, because of that, and so let's just be reminded, all right, we're students of God's Word. Jesus is a student of God's Word. We are, too, and that's why we're here. So I know I'm preaching to the choir right now. 
And I love the imagery that Ray Vonderlin uh, shares from the Jewish context of what it would have been like for little Jesus to be growing up in a synagogue. And we see him in the synagogue over and over again here. But what would happen uh, when children come to the synagogue for school, for education, to learn the Torah, uh, they would be uh, called to memorize not just the Torah. What's the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Not just the titles, but word for word. And so imagine that. Right? If we think education is hard today, this is what kids were learning. They would know the verses of the Bible. They would know the whole Torah. But that first day of class each school year, the rabbis would actually put honey on their slates. And then they'd have the kids lick the honey. Which maybe there's some germs going on there. But you know what they'd say? May the word of God be like honey on your lips. You know what honey was then and still is today? It's candy. It's for little kids. It's students of God's word. And so we see Jesus quoting the scriptures, right? And actually saying, haven't you guys read <clears throat> haven't you been a student of God's word? Apparently you haven't been because this happened. Right? You guys are getting this all wrong. Right? Be a student of God's word. And so we see that there as Jesus quotes. Uh, I wrote the word finisher. Finisher because I, I think sometimes we forget that when it comes to the Sabbath. Right? And so we're going to talk about Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath. But what took place the six days before the original Sabbath? Creation. Creation. And why did God take a Sabbath rest? Because he finished his work. He finished his work. When Jesus on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. Right? So oftentimes, at least in my own life, when I see in others' lives, right, we don't finish the job. We might go 90%, 99%, but it always just feels like something's lacking. But Jesus... Right, he's Lord of the Sabbath because he's God. And we already read from Colossians a couple weeks ago, right? Everything was created by him and for him and through him. Right? So he was there speaking. Right? He was the word of God in creation. And Jesus finished. He finished what he started. Because of that, he's Lord of the Sabbath. Right? And did he need to rest? No, he didn't need to rest. Right? Does God rest? What was Jesus' message? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? God is on the move. God is at work. Change your way of thinking. And oftentimes you think he's resting. Oftentimes you think, where are you? It feels like you're sleeping on the job. Right? If you would have been working for me, this wouldn't have happened. But we know in all things, God is working. Right? God doesn't need to rest. Who needs to rest? <coughs> we do. We do. And so let's, let's remember this. And so I did write the word finisher there before we get to Sabbath. Um, we don't need to go to Job. 38 through 41, but this is where God speaks, and he speaks about creation, he begins to ask the question, right, where were you, Job? Do you think you know who I am? And he proclaims that, yes, he's the creator, yes, he's God, but he's also the finisher. He's always at work, and he completes his task, and he's going to complete his task for Job, as the devil's trying to steal Job's joy in his life, we know that God shows up for Job. Uh, but he refers to creation. It's a great text if you just want to let God speak to you sometime. If you need a little humble pie, right. I think we all need that because we got to get that Pharisee out of us every day. Right. Go ahead and read Job 38 through 41 and just live in the, the vastness and the bigness, the hugeness of who God is. Right. But Jesus right, is calling himself Lord of the Sabbath. So we'll just call him Sabbath. We don't need to go to Matthew eleven twenty eight because I think a lot of us have that memorized. What does Jesus say? Come to me. I will give you Sabbath. I will give you Sabbath. I will give you rest. And, and so the point of the Sabbath, right, this is Jesus. He's the restorer. He's the refresher. And he is rest. Right? He is peace. And a question I wrote in our notes is, why do we still remember the Sabbath? Right? Is this still one of the commandments for us? Right? It seems like all the other commandments apply to us. Right? And we know the early church switched Sabbath to the first day of the week after the resurrection of Jesus took place because they wanted all the focus to be there. And so the sacred assembly, which was commanded to be part of the Sabbath right, in the book of Leviticus... All of a sudden, worship went to the first day of the week because it's about new beginnings, not endings now. Right? And this is the resurrection. 
right? It's always about new beginnings. But why do we, why do we still honor the Sabbath? Refocus. Refuel. Certainly when we come to church, right, to be fed, and that's part of it, right? I am not the Sabbath. He is. I am not God. I need to rest. I'm going to acknowledge who God is in this moment. Right? So that's huge. Right? Sabbath was made for me, not for God. And so thank you, God, for letting me know that I'm not you. Right? And then you guys heard, heard me say this before, but John the Baptist, when he's asked, are you the Christ, what does he say? I am not. I am not. Right? Sabbath was made for us so that we can say, I am not. I am not. Right? And there's so much freedom and release in that, and certainly God calls us to have good work ethic. Yes? Right? That's why we have life to, to do His kingdom work, to get out there and make a difference in this world. But, but thank you, Jesus, for giving me a day off. Right? And we actually know right, the children of Israel never had a day off in the Egypt and the bondage of slavery. And so this was huge for the children of Israel to get this commandment. And, and some of us have a tendency to be workaholics. But God says, take the Sabbath. Don't let work control you. and Don't get in your mindset. Don't be a Pharisee. Right? Acknowledge that you need something. You need fuel. Right? And so often in our world today, we don't even know how to take a Sabbath. But thank you, Jesus, for the sacred assembly. So that reminds us to have this holy habit, which we're going to talk about in a moment. A Sabbath. Any thoughts about the Sabbath? Questions? Concerns? Sabbath good? It's very good. Thank you, boss, for giving us a day off. Which day should we celebrate the Sabbath? Which day should we celebrate the Sabbath? Right? And so definitely Jesus fulfilled everything. Right? So we don't want to get stuck into that question, even though our minds go there. Right? But we celebrate Sunday usually as our Sabbath or Saturday. But Sunday, right, there, there's beauty in that, as the early church understood. Right? It was that day that changed everything. And so let's focus on the resurrection as we are in our Sabbath. Right? But certainly there's beauty in Saturday. There's imagery in Saturday, too, because that was the day Jesus was resting in a tomb and sanctifying and doing all of his work and crushing Satan and doing everything else he was doing on that day. Right? And there's beauty in that to end the week, right, and also to begin the week. But certainly God wants us to take a day off. I crave for a day off. My wife craves for me to have a day off. We know Sabbath is made for us. But we know what the Pharisees did. They made it into a big works thing. and They lost the gospel in it all, this gift of the Sabbath. But God wanted us to have this Sabbath so we would just rest and be refreshed so that we could be great workers for another six days and to get this rotation into our, our life. Sabbath. Jesus is Sabbath. He is Lord of Sabbath. Right? He is rest. Come to me. Right? Rest. So every day, every day is a Sabbath. Right? Every day we're refreshed. Every day we're refueled. Right? To get good patterns into our life, good habits into our life, and just to feel acknowledged. And I love uh, how Jesus identifies himself throughout the Gospel of John and how uh, Jesus identifies himself in Mount Sinai with Moses. Right? Who is he? I am. I am. Right? And so, I am not, but I know I am. Right? You can say that. Say that with me. I am not. Go ahead and touch your shoulder, touch your heart. Right? I am not. And then point your finger in there and say, but I know I am. Right? I know I am, and I am not. That's what Sabbath is about. That's what worship's about. When we gather together in the sacred assembly to acknowledge who God is and who we are not and to receive the gifts, the great gifts, the forgiveness of sins and the word, the fellowship and so much. Uh, I wrote in our notes too, he's the end of religion, right? Really he's the beginning of the relationship, right? And, and we can get stuck in semantics, right? But what we know is there's something completely different about Jesus and what he's trying to do to what came known as the Jewish religion. He's trying to remind them this is about a relationship, and ultimately the gospel. 
because we make it in the works so easily and we're just so contrary to understanding what grace is, what the gospel is. But Jesus is the end of the religion, he's the beginning of the relationship. If you're wondering what this is like, let me clarify it all, Jesus says. You've seen the Father if you've seen me. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus so we know exactly what this is supposed to be all about. Right? And that it's about a relationship. Relationship, relationship, relationship. And a relationship is a loving relationship. Religion right, has to do with me just going through habits because it's just the right thing to do, which sounds kind of good on the surface, but we know right, there's no relationship in that. If there's a relationship, right, we're talking, we're living and breathing. Right? We're receiving love, we're, we're giving love, we're being compelled. Right? The Apostle Paul says to the church in Corinth, it's the love of Christ that compels me. The love of Christ compels me. Right? Not, I need to earn my way to heaven. I need to earn favor. Right? I'm, in, I'm in fear and dread of Almighty God because He's not going to let me into heaven. No. It's the good news. Right? It's the Lord of the Sabbath. Right? That we truly have rest because of what Jesus has done for us. And so Galatians chapter 5, let's go there for a moment. Let me be reminded why I put that in our notes. So the relationship versus the religion. Right? And this was huge. It's still huge. There's people that talk about how Roman citizens would have been so shocked about the gospel and about a relationship right, with the true Caesar, Jesus. Because who had a relationship with Nero? Nobody. Right? The Caesar was just a distant Caesar. Right? But yet Jesus, right, the way the Christians were talking, he's our friend. He's our friend. Right? Could you imagine... <laughs> It's not about religion. It's not about him being up here. It's about him being right next to us. And so Paul talks about this freedom in Christ. And let's go right to... We'll go to verse 11. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, right? it's a, a religion thing, why am I still being persecuted? He's not talking about religion anymore. He's talking about a relationship. In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, those religious folk that are trying to get people circumcised, because that's what religion does, you have to behave a certain way in order to belong. Does that make sense? That's what religion says. You have to behave a certain way in order for you to belong. But what Christianity says, what Jesus says, is you belong. You belong, right? And behavior will probably most likely follow. Because when you belong, behavior follows, but we can't get those two flipped. Religion says behave, and then you can belong. Right? A relationship, the freedom in Christ says you belong. You belong first and foremost. And so he says this, as for those edged, I wish they would go all the way and emasculate themselves. You just picture... Right, the passion that Paul has against those who are trying to get people to do certain things certain ways because that's what you do. That's what you're supposed to do. And so it's a relationship versus a religion. Let's keep going now in Mark chapter 3. Still got time? So another time. Another time he went into the synagogue. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And a man with a shriveled hand was there. And so we've already seen Jesus, we've seen Jesus do healings, right? Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So some of them, being Pharisees or religious leaders, they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Not just eat some food or allow his disciples to have a snack. But Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, which is lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill. But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed their stubborn hearts and said to them, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with Herodians how they might kill Jesus. And so there's beauty there as we talked about the Sabbath and being restored. Right? Jesus is going to restore because that's what God's doing to us. On the Sabbath. But what we see happening here, and I'm going to go kind of quick now, 
as if I haven't been going quick. Sorry if I talk fast. I just, I eat fast too in life. I don't know, I just kind of go, 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 go. But I'm excited about this. So tell me to slow down if I need to slow down. But I'll slow down. So Jesus is the obedient one. Right? Let's not forget that. Right? And I have that in the notes because he's going to the synagogue. And he's not going against the law. He's not going against the Old Testament where people are accusing him of all this. In fact, in the Gospels, you see that the Pharisees and Sadducees actually couldn't find any fault with Jesus within the law right, as he's on trial. What they find fault in Jesus is that he's actually claiming to be God, which, okay, that's crazy. Or else, is he really God? Is he either really God or he's not? Like he's either lying, a lunatic, or he's actually God himself. Or they are saying he was lying. Or perhaps, as his family thought, he was a lunatic. But we know that he is Lord, but he was obedient. In Hebrews chapter 9, we don't need to go there. But what we know is that Jesus was perfect. Thank you if you went to Hebrews chapter 9. I appreciate that you went to the book of Hebrews. Right? But he's the perfect one, the perfect high priest. He was the only one that could take the sins of the world because he was obedient. He was perfect. He wasn't destroying the, the law in a way to where he's being disobedient to the Old Testament. He was fulfilling it. He was helping us understand what God meant through it and what Moses meant through those words. But he was perfect. Right? So let's not forget that he was obedient to the commandments. And because he was obedient to the commandments, he was able to be the atoning sacrifice for us, the one without blemish. Uh, he had holy habits. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. If you're already there, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. We have time for this. As we talk about Sabbath, I think this is fitting. And I just love it because another time he went into the synagogue is what Mark says. And you see Jesus going to the synagogue over and over and over again. Right? Why was he going to the synagogue? When did he go to the synagogue? Right? On Sabbath. He was going to the synagogue on Sabbath. He was not forsaking the sacred assembly. He was setting that model for us, but certainly he was going there as a teacher too. But Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, why don't we all say that together if you're there? Go ahead and read it together. And verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And verse 25, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Right? So I know I'm preaching to the choir right now, but Jesus right, had these holy habits. Right? He didn't give up the synagogue, the, the Sabbath rest. He, he lived that out. Right? So let us not give up meeting together right? as some are in the habit of doing it is so important right, to gather together for the sacred assembly and to gather together around God's word. And certainly we could talk and talk and talk about why people aren't coming to church. We just need to be the church. And we need to invite people and share Greg's story of love because we are his disciples. And that is the commandment to go and invite. To go and invite. To go and share the good news. And as we do that, right, people will see why it's so important to get together for the sacred Assembly. But he had holy habits. Uh, he is the attention grabber, right? Again, people are just drawn to him, but people are all looking at him. And this is interesting to me, and I, I know this is true because I've asked this question so many times in life. I've never had anybody not have an opinion about Jesus. Everybody knows something about Jesus, everybody's actually interested in Jesus. They might not like him a lot and be upset with him, but they get passionate about him and they say something about him. And I encourage you, it's the simplest question. It's on the top of your outline every week we get together. Who is Jesus? Are you sit on the airplane with somebody? Hey, let's talk about Jesus. You're getting your hair done? Let's talk about Jesus. What do you think about Jesus? And just get the conversation going. He's the gospel. He's the one that we need to talk about. It's so easy to talk about all these other things, but let's just talk about Jesus. I almost feel guilty talking about Jesus so much, but I don't feel guilty. I'm not going to let Satan get in my head and say it's too simple because it's not too simple. It's always about Jesus. 
we can't get distracted. He's the attention grabber, and you see this people's attention is on him. In First Peter chapter two, four through eight, right, that's where he talks about he's the stone. He's the he's a cornerstone. He's the stumbling block. Right? It's over him. It's all about him. Right? The way, the truth. In the life, we can't forget that. I love the book of Hebrews for a lot of different reasons. First, it's, just, it's part of the Bible, so I love all the books of the Bible. Um, but Hebrews, I, I love it because the author of Hebrews has to get people's attention off of Moses. Hey, it's not about Moses. It's about Jesus. He's got to get people's attention off of the angels. Right? It's not about the angels. It's about Jesus. Jesus is great. It's not about this high priest of Abimelech that we don't know much about, that people are always interested in. It's not about him. It's about Jesus. It's not about the high priest, right, where people are obsessed with the high priest. It's about Jesus. He's the high priest. The author of Hebrews does this, and I love it that all of a sudden this great hall of faith, right, where we see all these people that have gone before us, where certainly it is right for us to understand what they did, but do they get our attention? Right? At the end of that section, what does the author of Hebrews say? Does he say, let us fix our eyes on Moses, or Joshua, or Caleb, or Daniel, or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Elijah? He says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Right, so let's not forget that. It might sound simple. It might sound like the Sunday school answer, but that's the answer. Right? He needs to be the one to whom our attention goes to, and that we're drawn to. It's so easy and it's right because there's real questions out there that we need to discuss. Right? And, and there's great examples of the faith that we need to heed to. Right? But it always has to be about Jesus. And I would challenge you and encourage you for us pastors. Right? Sometimes it might, it might get a little distracted with the rest of the Bible. And, and our preaching and our teaching. But please remind us, hey pastor, tell us more about Jesus. And certainly the Bible all points to Jesus, so I hope we don't do that. Right, but there's a temptation where we just get focused in on, on this person, like Joshua, and talk about Joshua, but ultimately Joshua is a shadow of Jesus. He's a type of Jesus. And to get us to Jesus, and so feel free to encourage your pastors to talk more about Jesus. Alright? Is that alright? Okay. Alright. So, verse 5 of Mark chapter 3 he looked around at them in anger, right, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And so I wrote in the notes, right, he grieves. He grieves. Uh, we talked about this at, at the congregational meeting this past Sunday. We went to Psalm 95, which is the, the theme of the whole year, right? Raise the praise. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise. When you go through that text, you see at the end about how God grieved. And actually, the word in the English, I think, is loathe. Right? right? He grieved. Right? And I see a lot of parents here, right? And we see our kids make choices that we wish they didn't make, or we see our kids get hurt. Right? What happens in our heart? We grieve. Right? And there's a little bit of righteous anger there because we, it just shouldn't be that. Right? And so we see the heart of Jesus, right? the heart of the one that loves us, right? in addressing. His anger and deeply distressed their stubborn hearts. And so he, he grieves that sin in our life that you and I do so often. Right? It breaks his heart. That doesn't mean he doesn't love us. It actually means he does love us. Right? We talk about the alien nature of God versus the, the natural nature of God. Right? God's nature, and I see parents here, and so let's talk to you. We want to love our kids. Do I ever want to discipline my kids? Do I come home and I think in my head, I can't wait to spank my kid or put him on a timeout or take something away or, or yell at them or get them to respect me? But I have to do that stuff. I don't want to do that stuff. I have to do that stuff because that's what love does. That's what love requires of me. Right? What Father Hebrew says, right, doesn't discipline their sons. The one that doesn't is one that doesn't love them. Thank God that he loves us, that Jesus loves us. Right? And gives us that example too, because it's still hard for me to discipline my kids. I don't like doing I don't like having re- conflict in relationships and dealing with that. But I have to deal with it. Right? You have to deal with it. You have to deal with it. There's conflict in the congregation. Guess what? 
You have to deal with it. You got to get people to talk. You got to have those hard conversations. But who wants to have those hard conversations? But yet we do because we know we have to. We know things would be good if we do. But Jesus is the one that has a heart, and we have a heart like his. We grieve too when people are stubborn. When we ourselves are stubborn. Don't forget about that. And those aren't tears and grief of disappointment. Right? It's because he knows what's good for us. He wants the best for us. He wants that and he craves that for us. And when we don't live in that, right? that grieves him. That grieves him. That gives him distress. Right? Revelation 21, verse 5 is where Jesus says he's making all things new. And so we see Jesus restore. Right? He is the restorer. And we'll conclude with this. Uh, misunderstood. Jesus is misunderstood. Right? And we're going to see this a lot as we move forward in the Gospel of Mark. Right? He's misunderstood. Does anybody understand him? Does anybody truly get him? And the question for us is, do we understand him? I think we're getting there. I think we understand him. Right? But so often we misunderstand what he says. And if you look at the rest of just looking up uh, through the text, we're going to do a little fast forward. And the crowds are following Jesus. Do the crowds really understand Jesus throughout the Gospels? If they don't understand the loaves are coming to him for the wrong reasons, and the crowd turn on him at the end. Right? Do the disciples really understand Jesus? Sometimes they get it, but most of the time Jesus is saying in Mark chapter 8, verse 21, he actually says, you still don't understand me. You're still getting this wrong. Right? And in Mark chapter 3, if you, you keep moving forward, it says Jesus and Beelzebub, verse 20. Right? These are the people actually misunderstanding him, actually claiming that he's got demons in him, that he's Satan himself. Right? He's being misunderstood. And then you see Jesus' his mother and brothers. Do they understand him at this point? No. Right? And so the question is, how do we gain understanding? How do you gain understanding? Being in His Word. Being in His Word? Right. How do you gain understanding? Husbands, how do you gain understanding from your wife if you're struggling to understand her? <laughs> Ask her questions. Listen. Right. Take time. Is it easy? No, it takes a little bit of work to understand people. And again, that's why we're here, to understand God and his message for us. Um, I always say, and William Covey wrote a, a book about healthy habits of healthy people. But what's beauty, beautiful about that is it all comes from the book of Proverbs. Does that sound like the book of Proverbs, healthy habits, and healthy people? And in the book of Proverbs, it talks about understanding. And a, a patient man has great understanding. Right? Seek to understand before you're understood. Right? Seek to understand before you're understood. Right? And we need to seek to understand Jesus. Right? And the way we do that is we ask questions. Right? We ask questions. What happens when we ask questions? We get answers. What happens, what are answers, typically? Truth. Right? And what happens when we get truth? We're set free. It's good to ask questions. It's good to be a student of the Word. Right? Will any of us ever arrive on this side of eternity with all the answers? Should we ever stop asking questions and seeking to understand God's heart? No. And that's hard. But it's the Pharisee inside of us. It's perhaps the, the slothfulness, the laziness, or, or the pride and the sense of accomplishment. I love studying the Word with you all. Even as I was preparing, I was learning stuff. And even as we're talking... As I'm talking a lot, I'm learning stuff as I'm talking. God's Word is amazing. And so may we continue to seek to understand so that we don't misunderstand uh, the message of the Gospel. And so how about uh, we wrap up in prayer? If you guys could just spend some time with the table people, hey, your friends at the tables with you, and go ahead and take prayer requests, however you want to do it. Someone at your table could pray. If you all want to pray, go for it. We just want us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Go ahead and pray the Lord's Prayer together. But just spend some time in prayer. And then don't forget we're all invited uh, to this luncheon right afterwards. 
And I believe that there are going to be some announcements after our prayer time, too, about upcoming opportunities that I believe you got some handouts for, too. And so go ahead and pray. And then we're going to have an announcement. And then we're going to eat some food.